so thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction, and also thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me, and also for inviting me to this workshop. Um, so my talk is uh, is related to this ongoing workshop, which uh, Dick mentioned. Um, but the talk, and I'm very impressed at all the world experts, which the institute manages to attract for these workshops. Uh, but this talk isn't. Uh, or in towards the experts, it's a more general talk. And it's not a survey talk either, it's kind of a journey through various topics uh, in which I've been, uh, by which I've been intrigued in this area. So, um, so, so uh, let me start. Um, so I'll say some very general things. Um, so the first thing is that um, you know, computer science has gone a very long way with just using kind of yes, no. Uh, criteria. So with the uh, Turing conception of compu computation, um, what has come out of it is that not only is the model of computation where everything is just yes, no uh, enough, but even considering you know, the problems to be yes, no problems are, are you know, very universal and kind of good enough for, for computation. And so besides the fact that we all carry around powerful Turing machines in our pockets now, uh, other important Consequences, I think, of, of Turing's work on computing was the rise of discrete mathematics. That um, because computation, discrete computation, is so successful, you know, why look any, anywhere else? And this tradition of of yes/no computation is enormously successful, of course, beyond Turing. And certainly, one very major achievement was that of MP, MP, discovery of MP completeness in the early 70s, which uh, was done in the tradition of of computing quantities with mathematics, which is very kind of yes/no, um, and by quantities, uh, when I contrast quantities with yes/no, I'm very modest. So if, if you got two or three values, that's a quantity for me. I don't need an infinite number. Okay, so I just want to go beyond uh, yes/no. Um, so the question is, you know, in, in computer science, do we have to go beyond that? And um, so uh, maybe not. Um, so the argument for yes is first. There are many problems in the world which are inherently quantitative, so you know, maybe we should give them their due respect. Um, but maybe the more important uh, reason in my mind is that, so the main quarrel I have with this tradition is that it's internally it's not totally uh, self-fulfilled. So in particular, the NP completeness question isn't resolved. So from that point of view, looking broader somewhere else to get inspiration for what it all means is a justification uh, in itself. So, um, and okay. So the other general comment about uh, computer science from people who've, uh, who are not computer scientists is that, of course, many computer scientists look at the computer. In some sense, here we are looking at computer science before we get to the computer. We're looking at um, the application. Think about applications uh, before you get to the computer. And of course, the observation is that there is incredible science just about the applications even before you touch the computer. OK, so, um, okay, so I'll define a few things which we'll be very familiar, familiar with to experts. Um, so I'll look at applications, which are to do with uh, graphs. So this is a graph. It's got four vertices and some edges. And uh, okay, this graph happens to be, has, has a name. It's the complete graph on four vertices. It's called K4. And I'll look at a particular question about graphs, which is matchings. Um, so given a, a graph with these vertices and edges, a matching is just a set of edges from the graph which don't share any vertex. So this is a matching, the set of edges happens to have one edge, and that's another matching, uh, two edges, but the point is the edges uh, don't meet anywhere, so, so it's a, this is a matching. And a matching is perfect if these edges, in fact, uh, go to every vertex. So this two-edge matching is a perfect matching. Okay, so the various questions you can ask. Uh, one is the existence question, like PM, perfect matchings. Does G have a perfect matching? Uh, existence question, and for this example, the answer is yes. It's got a perfect matching. I've shown you one. Another question um, is counting. How many perfect matchings does it have? And there the, the answer is three, because you, could, uh, you can take this one, you could take the two vertical edges, or you could take the two diagonal edges. They're all three perfectly good, perfect matchings. Um, but uh, another thing which uh, is traditional for combinatorialists 
is to make a, a polynomial out of it, um, which means that you add a, a, a variable for every uh, edge. Well, first you name the vertices, numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so the edge x2, 3 goes from vertex 2 to vertex 3. And then the polynomial you associate with, with this perfect matching problem has a one monomial for each perfect matching, and the uh, monomial x1, 2, x3, 4 uh, are the labels of, the, of that particular perfect matching. Because so this is a generating polynomial for perfect matchings. So in general, for any combinatorial problem, uh, you can ask, you know, is there a solution? How many solutions? And you can also make up this, this polynomial, um, which somehow you know, has one. If you, if you plug in one for all the variables, you, you get the three. So in some sense, these problems get harder and harder. Um, but in another sense, uh, they become more algebraic, more mathematical. So it helps to go in that direction sometimes. Um, OK, so, um, um, so if a uh, special case, if the graph is bipartite, which means that you can split the, edge, the vertices into two sets, and all the edges go from one set to the other, they will go from left to right, then there's a, another little formulation, which is that you can give the same numbers to the vertices on the right as the left, and then the variables get renamed. But still, this is still the perfect matching polynomial. But then you can regard these entries as entries of a matrix, and uh, then this function is also known as the permanent. So it's a polynomial where you look at all the entries, you multiply sets of entries all in different rows and columns in all possible ways. Okay, so it's like the determinant, except there's no, uh, si no signs. Um, okay, so there are many interesting polynomials you can construct on, on such a graph. So the determinant is equivalent to linear algebra, the permanent I've discussed, and then there are any number of other things you can, you can do. So for example, if you've got a network, you can regard each uh, variable as the probability of that uh, edge failing. And then you may want to compute some question about the reliability of this network, maybe the probability that it disconnects or that some node gets isolated or anything else, a lot of reliability problems. And all these things are just polynomials in these variables. Um, and then you can just pick a, a, a polynomial, a, a problem which you know is hard, like Hamiltonian circuits, and you could make up the Hamiltonian circuits polynomial. Okay, so. Um, so, well, so it turns out that when you ask how hard these are to, are to compute, then as we know, the determinant is easy. Linear algebra is equivalent to it. But it turns out that all the other ones I've mentioned and uh, almost anything else you, you care to think of will turn out to be, to be hard. And so the best way known is by some exponential uh, computation. Um, and um, so we'll say a few more a little bit more about uh, what's involved. Um, but um, uh, so, in so, so some sense, this algebraic framework is where people may have come across computational complexity even before um, the computer scientists uh, did. It was called the curse of dimensionality. The idea that the f familiar operations you do, uh, which are easy, but if you do it in many dimensions, the, you pay exponential costs. So just one illustration, so the permanent which I defined is a sum of products. And so this is a matrix of terms. And you sum over all permutations. And then you take a product of elements, uh, one from each row and one from each column. Okay. And since they're n factorial permutations, uh, this uh, expression, if you write it out fully, is exponentially long. And if you computed that, that's uh, um, not, not practical. So an example of a, of a polynomial which is easy to compute is, again, let's look at the xij as a, as, a, uh, as a matrix. So let's ignore the y's. So xij is a matrix. So here, summing over j means you, you sum each row. OK, so you've got a matrix. You sum up all the entries in a row. And you, you multiply these together for, for each of the rows. So this is a very easy expression of size n squared. So this is easy to compute. And just a little variation. So in your matrix, every element in the, y th in the jth column are multiplied by a new variable yj. Okay. 
okay, still easy, easy to compute. But uh, so this is an easy to compute. The thing up there looks hard um, and conjecture to be hard. Um, but um, by the curse of dimensionality, people mean that um, even though this is something very tan easy to compute, this polynomial, certain operations which you uh, think ought to be easily like uh, differentiation or integration become hard in high dimensions. And in fact, uh, why one reason to understand how these are hard is that if you just differentiate this uh, easy expression, uh, you get the permanent. And if you integrate it, you also get the permanent. And you're integrating n fold or, uh, over these various new variables. Okay, so you can easily, easily check that. So, you know, so the calculus we were taught in high school, um, we thought it was, everything was computationally easy. Differentiate 3x squared, we knew how to do it. But in high dimensions, it becomes equivalent to um, this permanent. Okay. Um, so how, how does one understand the difficulty of these various polynomials? Um, well, in computer science, uh, a very important technique is just reduction, is, you know, you don't understand problem A or problem B, but you try to show that um, if you could do problem B, the blue thing, then you could easily do problem A. You can transfer the difficulty of problem, of problem A to problem B. And there are various notions of, of reduction, and a very important one is, is called uh, carp reduction, where um, to uh, do the green problem, take some input, you do some computation on the input, and then you just apply this, the you apply the result of the computation to the input of your blue problem, and lo and behold, the answer to the blue problem is the answer to the, to the original green problem. Okay, so this is a, a simple reduction. You could imagine you use the blue triangle many different times, but you just use it once. Uh, the answers are the same, but you have to do some pre-computation. So, um, so it turns out that many MP complete problems are complete, are reducible, are equivalent in this sense. Um, so the question is, uh, are there any simpler uh, reductions? And uh, so the answer is uh, yes. And so one is called projection reduction. And the difference is that here, uh, there's no computation. Computation has gone away. All you do is you get some inputs to the, pro to the problem, and you supply the same inputs to, as inputs to, to, your, um, to your blue problem, but maybe you know, a particular input you, you supply three times, and you also supply some constants, maybe. Okay, so here there's very little, very little computation. And almost, also, almost in this reduction, compute, computation has gone away. It's, it's like a mathematical reduction. It's a substitution. Okay, so the computer science uh, aspect seems to have uh, seems to have vanished. Um, and so, in co conventional terms, this is like uh, before we did some computation here, but now we're using this blue thing as a, as a package. Okay, we're just plugging in uh, values. So, is this an important uh, uh, distinction? Uh, well, uh, you know, I think maybe it is because um, uh, if you think about it. So if you read Turing's paper in 1936 and had a lot of foresight, uh, what would you have uh, forecast? Well, maybe two things. One is that uh, everyone would carry around a powerful Turing machine in their pockets in 80 years' time. You would have been correct. Um, but the other thing you may have forecast is that if this universal computation is so magical, maybe everyone 80 years later would be programming all day. And that, that's not true. Most of us don't program too much. Okay? We, just, we just plug in values to programs. We use programs as, as packages. So, you know, typing in an email address in an email package probably doesn't sound like something um, uh, too deep a pheno phenomenon to ponder over, but uh, say in scientific com computing also people don't program very much. They use packages for linear algebra. So, to, so, so the idea is that important problems you want to solve, you can solve by plugging in values to some more generic uh, um, function. Okay. And so, um, so it turns out that, um, in fact, um, all these polynomials and any number of others you can think of um, are, um, are, in fact, equivalent to each other just by this substitution without any programming. So the, um, so the sense in which they're equivalent has no computational content. It's just pure, pure mathematical content. 
And also, if you ask that, maybe in the definition of the class, it's complete in like NP. Um, well, even there, you can define the class in which these things are complete in uh, almost purely mathematically. There's, there's no computation in there. Um, so uh, one could argue that clearly this ph phenomenon of NP completeness in other classes was clearly discovered by computer scientists. But it's a much more general kind of mathematical phenomenon. And so, you know, it's, so it's not obvious why Archimedes couldn't have conceptualized it. There's no, you know, we just uh, you know, plug in values, okay? So it's a substitution. It's, a, it's, a, it's the most basic mathematical notion. Um, so, uh, so then the question of whether, um, whether the permanent, although the permanent is equivalent by the substitution to almost everything, every polynomial you can think of in this, uh, in this form formulation is, is in fact, does have an easy computation, can also be formulated as whether it's a, it's a projection of something easy to compute the determinant. So this is a mathematical problem which is being widely pursued. Again, it's got no superficially mathematical content. It's a question of whether this, problem, this matrix function uh, you, you can get from this one by, by substitution. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, so, okay, so this, this talk does have a plan. Okay, so I've done the first segment, um, which is emphasizing that, that counting and algebraic complexity are, are very much uh, related. Okay, so, um, so I want to get to my uh, second part, which is uh, holographic algorithms. And, uh, and I'll start the same way. Um, so what I said was that uh, uh, many important problems you can uh, reduce to each other just by substitution. Um, so then the question is, uh, is this the simplest relationship between two problems you can have, or is there something even simpler which, which helps? Okay. Okay, so, um, so it's hard to imagine that there's anything simpler, uh, but there is. And the simpler thing is to do nothing. Okay. You do nothing. And uh, what this means is that um, if you want to solve this problem, uh, you, you've got some inputs, four inputs, and you just pass the inputs to your, to your other problem and you get the answer. Okay. Doesn't look impressive. Um, but so this really means that these two functions are literally the same function, the same function. Okay, so, um, so this is called a holographic reduction. Okay, it's extremely simple, okay. Um, and so we're basically asking when are two functions the same, okay. So maybe there's a theorem that apples are oranges, but you've just missed this piece of information. Okay, so, um, so it's that kind of thing. When there are two things which look dissimilar, but in fact are the same. So that's what you want to use it for. And so to illustrate this, um, again, let's go back to matchings. And so we need a bit of uh, notation to uh, introduce. Uh, these are called signatures. So, um, so now I'll code up the, instead of using words to describe uh, a combinatorial property, I'll use some uh, notation. And what this says is that, so I'll look at properties which take subsets of edges. And uh, so this represents position 0, 1, 2, or 3. And the 1 here means that whenever there's one edge chosen instant to, to a node, I like that, I give it a weight 1. And, and if there were zero edges, I'd, uh, if there were zero, two, or three edges, I'd give it zero. Okay, so for example, um, okay, so d this little notation. Um, okay, so the number of matchings in this graph is three, as before. Another property is parity. Is this number odd or even? It's odd. And you can also ask existence questions. So this notation doesn't. Uh, um, bias what the question you, you're going to ask. Okay, um, so just to emphasize the uh, notation, so, um, so again, so this is a subset of edges. Some vertices have, have, have one edge use, some have two. And this property would say that whenever I've got one edge used, I'll give it a weight of three. Whenever I've got two edges used, I'll give it a weight of minus two. Okay, so this particular example for this property would, this value would be 3 times 3 times minus 2 times minus 2, 
which is uh, 36, okay? And then the counting problem is, to, uh, is for all subsets of these edges to count up its value, okay? So that's a counting problem. So I've defined a signature, which defines the problem, and uh, um, uh, the exponentially many different subsets of edges in a graph, that's why these problems are hard, potentially. And I, I want to compute the sum of all exponentially many things uh, of this value, okay? So in this case, um, since its value is one, um, I'll, I'll just be counting perfect matchings because the only edge sets will, which won't become zero are those where every vertex is met with one edge, okay? So this counts perfect matchings, okay? But as an illustration, I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, this function, not two, which unless you're an expert in this area, you will never have heard of, I'm sure, um, for good reason. Um, and so this says that, um, you know, if there's one edge incident to vertex, um, I, I like it. If there's three, I like it as well. Um, if there was zero, that's okay as well. But if there's a single vertex with the two edges incident, then the whole thing would be, would be uh, worth nothing, okay? Okay, so what I want to count is, um, is uh, how many subsets of edges are there in a graph where no subset causes uh, exactly two of them to meet at a vertex, okay? So it's a, it's a strange combinatorial problem, and so why not this? Okay, um, and uh, okay, so it's an exercise. So the question is, is this easy or hard? Okay, so is this the exponential effort? Do you have to enumerate all the cases, or is there some, some shortcut? So this is what we study in complexity theory, th these kind of questions. And uh, so this particular problem was open for, for, for a while. It was some strange thing, and no one knew what it was. Um, okay, so for, as an exercise for, for this four vertex graph, for this complete graph, the answer is 15. You know, you can, you can choose uh, no edges. You can choo if you choose one edge, you can do it in, in six ways. They're all good solutions. Um, and you can pick two edges, three edges, six edges. There's no way of choosing five edges because then somewhere you've got two edges coming to a vertex. Okay, so the answer is 15. Okay, so the exercise for those who haven't seen this is, is this an easy problem or a hard problem? Okay, it looks like some arbitrary combinatorial problem. And so this is, you can ask this question for any, gr any graph where every vertex has degree three. And so, uh, you know, so off the internet you can get lots of them. These are nice and symmetric. They're certainly different. Um, and... Uh, the most numbers of these. Okay, so again, for each of the each of these has uh, 16 vertices, 24 edges. Um, so there are two to the 24 different sets of edges you can consider. Each has a value, and we, you know, we want to add up. The value is always zero or one. We want to add up how many um, you get. Okay, so it's a strange problem. Um, so um, okay, so uh, the, the question is: Is it easy or hard? Well, so there is a theorem which says that um, of this apple and oranges kind, and the theorem says that um, this, this is the problem we're discussing, how many solutions when not two, okay? And uh, so the theorem says that this problem um, is, e is the same problem as something else. Okay, the, again, what I was saying, there are two functions which are the same function, uh, no substitutions, nothing, the same function, except the apple and orange, which are really the same, but, but you never knew. Um, and then this is the other function. And then you have to figure out what this means. Okay, so this function says that um, if there are three edges coming in, then you get a value, sorry, then you get a value y. If there are no edges coming in, you get a value x. And if there's one or two, you get value zero. Okay. And in fact, the x and y are some funny quantities with root fives in. Okay. But then our question is, so if this, you couldn't recognize what this meant, so can anyone who hasn't seen this before recognize what, what this means? So this is a, a much more intuitive function. Um, so any offers? So well, what are we kind of counting here? So what, what, are, what are solutions to this? Um, so what edge sets are solutions to this, uh, which are, have non-zero weight? 
Yes, yes. So the point is that um, at least, okay, so suppose the graph is connected. The point is that if uh, you've got a vertex, you get some credit for it if, the, if there are no edges uh, adjacent to it. You get a value x. But as you go out, if, there no, if, there, if there's no edge here, then there can't be any edge there or there because otherwise this will get a value zero, okay? So once you start with, a, with, with no edges adjacent to vertex, then this spreads like a contagion. The only way to get non-zero weight is to cover the whole graph with zero. Or you can start with the vertex, give it weight y, all the three edges are there, then by contagion, the whole graph has to uh, be full of edges and all have weight y, okay? So the moral is that the number of, the answer to this is always uh, x to the n plus y to the n, where, um, okay, so the conclusion of the theorem is that uh, for this graph, it's got, I don't know, uh, 10 vertices, so either it's x, to, it's x to the 10, there are just two solutions, which are non-zero, the weights are x to the 10 and y to the 10, and x and y are these funny things with root fives in, and if you work this out amazingly, you get the whole number, 625. And in fact, that's the number of solutions of this graph, okay? That's the number of these strange, uh, not two solutions of this graph, okay? Um, but what's the important point? Of course, the important point is that uh, this answer didn't de depend on the graph, okay? This is true for every graph with 10 vertices. Okay, so this graph, okay, so, so this function so what do we conclude about this function? How many not two solutions for these? Um, okay, these have 16 vertices. Um, okay, that's the number of solutions. But both graphs have the same number of solutions. Okay. You know the answer without looking at the input. So, okay, so that's probably not a very interesting problem. Okay, so the reason why no one's ever heard of this problem is that, um, um, you know, it's, uh, no, no one would want to compute this. Okay. Um, but anyway, but, but so this is kind of a, a, a parlor trick, okay? But um, it illustrates the power of, uh, of mappings, which, um, um, of having two ways of saying what the same function is. So uh, briefly, what the theorem does, the theorem is really something proved by a computer in, in a microsecond. Um, so what's b behind the proof is are just some linear identities. So these are the two combinatorial things you're showing to be equal. And uh, so basically, you, you stretch out these, these uh, so this is a three input, these are all three input functions. So you have to stretch it out into eight, two to the three. Um, so, um, you know, so, the, so this is really the same as the one, one, zero, one stretched out. Okay, so um, all the places where the address has a single one, this, this, and this has a one. So this one becomes three ones. And this one becomes one one, okay, and this thing gets stretched out to this. So, um, so the fact that these problems are the same is equivalent to a statement that there's a linear transformation uh, between these uh, signatures. Okay, so by having formalized the combinatorial problem as a uh, as a signature, the reward is you don't have to think anymore. You plug it into, into a computer, and the computer will tell you what are equivalent problems. Okay, um, so I, I haven't done all the details, but it's basically you're looking for a simple uh, linear transformation, um, and it happens to be these quantities with root fives in, uh, which map uh, between these two problems. Okay, um, so that's uh, an example of uh, of two ways of looking at the same function. Okay, so okay, so for every graph. This, fu this function is the same as this function. They're the same. You give every input, they've got the same answer. But it doesn't look at, that, look at it that way from just looking at the definition. So that's what the whole graphic transformation is. Um, so uh, this particular instance uh, is an instance of what's called a Fibonacci gate. And these were studied systematically by Tsai, Lu, and Xia. Um, so it's a, it's a general class with properties vaguely related to what I've described. But it can be studied systematically. And, and roughly, it's, the class is defined by having a single recurrence relation, which, which defines all the signatures which, which you have. Okay. So um, uh, it's kind of a two-second explanation of what these, these holographic reductions are. 
very informal. This is how I like to think about it, is that um, you've, got, you're, you're, you've got this graph, which you're asking some question about. So we'll make it kind of bipartite, and we call them generators and recognizers. And we'll shoot out some particles from the generators. So generator shoots out N, N, P, and P. There'll be Ns and Ps, and the recognizers receive them. And uh, so the generators will generate uh, the eight different combinations of Ns and Ps with different uh, coefficients. These are numbers. And the recognizers will receive three of these or some other number of these with different uh, numerical values. Um, and then the, this, the value of this whole thing, which we call a Holand, is the sum over the values of all states. So a state is just an assignment of p's and n's to all the edges. If you assign p's and n's to all the edges, then these generators and recognizers will give you numbers everywhere. You multiply them together. That's the value of the state. And you add up all the exponential number of states. OK, so that's a, a generic uh, kind of exponential sum expression, a bit like partition uh, functions in physics. And so, well, so what's, uh, OK, so if you want to express perfect matchings, then you'll make sure that, you'll, that every node emits just a single p, and every node receives just a single p. Okay, and if you know, anything else, you, you zero out. Okay, so this somehow counts perfect matchings. Uh, you know, this may be easy to compute or hard to compute. This is just the definition so far. But in the same spirit, we can add to the definition. And what the holographic transformation is, is that you, s you have an eavesdropper on each line. And this isn't uh, a malicious eavesdropper. This is kind of a neutral one. And this is really a, a translator. And what the translator does is the translator just receives a signal, translates it into uh, his or her own language by this linear transformation, and then, trans then translates it back again to the original language. Okay, so it's like you know, having uh, these blue people, these original people communicate in English, and these eavesdroppers sort of translate what they get into French, and then they translate back into English and pass it on. Okay, so they're totally innocuous. They don't interfere with what's going on. But they do have a different view of what's going on. Okay. These people think of the, what's going on in French, and these people think of it in English. Okay. So in our terms, uh, there's a linear transformation. So there's, some, there's this internal linear transformation on the definition of the function. And so there's you know, many ways of looking at the same function being computed. So that's, that's kind of an intuitive definition. And uh, so how this is used, so in fact, you know, saying, uh, Look, you know, there's amazing different functions, and how come you didn't know that they're, they're, they're the same? So those things are hard to find, but even without that, these things have uses because usually to find a fast algorithm, we transform um, some natural signature to an unnatural one, but one for which we know how to compute fast. Okay, and so one um, thing to reduce to is this famous result of Fisher, Castellin, and Tempoli that you can uh, compute the number of perfect, perfect matchings in planar graphs efficiently. So a holographic transformation is just a reduction. And if you want to use it, you have to, when you reduce A to B, you have to know something about A or B. So you can use it both ways. So if uh, um, B you can ev compute efficiently, then uh, you can compute A as well. And also, um, it can be used the other way as evidence of hardness. So if one problem you know is, say, complete. So sharp B complete means that it's, it's provably a hardest counting problem in, in its class. Then by this reduction, we can show maybe that your problem uh, is as hard. It's the same problem. Okay. Um, but as uh, practitioners know, so by itself, this method doesn't do that much. But in combination with other techniques which are well known, uh, it is a very useful technique. And the other techniques for, re for reducing problems to each other. So one is to have gadgets. So this goes back to MP completeness, uh, especially Dick Karp's paper. And for counting problems, uh, polynomial interpolation, where uh, you reduce one problem to another um, by having by calling many calling the other problem many times and reducing the issue to a one-off polynomial interpolation. interpolation. Okay, so maybe this sounds strange. So 
what's this you know, n do nothing reduction? So you know, are there any classical examples where there are two functions which are the same? Um, well, people people haven't noticed or took a long time noticing. But of course, you could say that uh, you know, almost any statement in mathematics is, is of this nature. You show that a equals b, and presumably people didn't didn't know it before. So in some sense, that's what we're saying. But this is a bit different because we're trying to show that the two functions, even graph functions, which which are really the same, but it's not obvious that, that they are the same. And this, so the so one classic example I know is uh, and a very important one is by Van der Verden. Um, so this is important in, in statistical physics, easing problem. Um, so this is the uh, um, easing problem, uh, also known as cuts in computer science, where um, you use these two signatures. And basically, uh, here you've got it's a vertex, and it's maybe either magnetic or not magnetic. And then these link vertices. And if you link two magnetic or two non-magnetic vertices, you get a certain reward. But if you link a magnetic and non-magnetic one, then you get a different re reward. So this is the easing problem. And so van der Weyden has a theorem which says that, lo and behold, this is the same as some, something else which looks different. And this is some sort of parity problem. This is looking at sets of edges in a graph where there's an even number of edges incident to each, uh, each vertex. Okay. Um, so, okay, so he had, uh, okay, so colon means that, um, so I'm allowed to use both, uh, um, both, both signatures as, co as components. Okay, so the colon means that I'm going to use it in a bipartite way. So these things will feed into these things and these into these things. Okay. If, otherwise, you could just put them, put, put them together arbitrarily. Okay. So, uh, so in particular, um, usual interpretation is that these are vertices and then these are edges which link two vertices. Okay. Um, and then Van der Waarden did have this funny, uh, you need funny weights. Okay. Um, okay, so, so for, certainly f for any fixed arity, uh, you can formulate this as a holographic re reduction. Uh, his proof uh, didn't look that way, but again, this is maybe a very natural instance of a holographic reduction which your computer can prove in a, in a microsecond. Well, it, it means, uh, um, and you can use both of these, uh, these uh, signatures, um, but, uh, but these signatures have to be used opposite each other. So, so, the, so the graph, so I've got a graph with edges, and uh, I, I assign a uh, signature to each vertex. And you can assign these to some vertices and these to some vertices. But the colon means that the graph is bipartite. And I have to assign these on the left and these on the right. OK. OK. Um, but this is equivalent to the classical theory of, uh, of the easing problem for planar graphs. OK. I'm, I'm just pointing out that uh, there's some prehistory there. OK. So. Uh, OK, so let's go on to, uh, OK, so these, these segments get shorter and shorter. Um, so, um, so what do we like to prove in, in, uh, in, com in uh, complexity theory? Well, again, these are <coughs> we're discussing problems. This is application space. And so NP is this class of problems where you can uh, verify a solution fast but you can't necessarily verify candidate solutions fast, but you can't necessarily um, um, find one fast. OK, so um, some things, P is what you can compute efficiently. NP compete is what's provably the hardest members of NP. Uh, so it's possible that all three classes are the same, because that's, an, that's, an, that's the major open problem. Um, and, uh, but, but, if it's, uh, but if it's not, then one other result which is known called Ladner's theorem is that if P is different from NP, then there are also problems in NP which are different from either of these. So there are problems of intermediate difficulty. So NP, either NP collapses to P, or it's pretty complicated. And complicated means that um, there are other strange things which are neither P nor NP complete. OK. Well, um, so, short, well so, so certainly resolving P equals NP would be a good thing to do. Uh, but what's the second best? So the second best which people can do is, is what's called a dichotomy theorem. And this is 
defining some class here of problems, which is hopefully a natural class, um, which uh, has the property that uh, within this class, this syntactically easily recognized class, uh, everything is either MP complete or MP. There's, there's no, no Ladner's theorem. Okay. And uh, so kind of the practical utility of this is, I suppose computer scientists put other people out of work. So this is an attempt to put uh, uh, computer scientists out of work because um, I suppose the utility of a complexity theorist is that if you have an arbitrary problem, you can take it to your computer scientist friend and say, is this easy or is it hard? Um, but you know, we're trying to auto automate this. So if your problem lies within an easily recognized class, you just look it up, you just work it out for yourself. Is it, e is it easy or hard? Okay. So there is a long history of dichotomy theorems. And, uh, and for counting, I think these are ex especially uh, impressive. Um, and uh, so some very impressive ones uh, have been proved by people who are in this room, uh, Tsai, Lu, Xia, Chen, and some others. Um, and they really show that for some very, very uh, well-defined class, um, you can figure out what's easy or hard. So I'll give you an example, which may not be the best uh, illustration, but it's easy to explain in the remaining minutes. OK, so the third issue you can worry about is preparity. So is the number of solutions even or odd? So this is somehow intermediate between counting and uh, existence. Um, it's got some advantages. OK, so and again, for parity, there are problems which are complete for parity. This is count mod 2, and problems which are easy. OK, so for these, I'll give you one uh, um, theorem, which, again, I'm saying because there are many others I could mention, but this one is kind of uh, easy to explain at this point. OK, so what is it about? So again, we see these, these uh, signatures. Um, so can we recognize any of, the, any of these? Um, so, okay, so, okay, so this is like a perfect matchings. So we, we insist one neighbor being a one, uh, you know, but not of the others. And uh, so this thing sounds a bit like uh, this not two. This is like not two. This starts like not two. Zero, one, okay, not two, okay? So anyway, so what these theorems say is that, um, okay, so now, now there are commas between these signatures, okay? <laughs> so. So you give me any set of signatures you can make up of zeros and ones. And my question is, um, you know, if I s throw these onto a note of a graph, and I want to compute how many solutions that problem has, the parity of it is that easy or hard. And so this theorem says that, uh, yes, in every case, it's either polynomial time or it's complete. OK, so there's two problems, OK? But you, know, you can come out with signatures of, of, of any uh, sizes. And we'll tell you whether the problem was easy or hard. So for most of these things, most problems are hard. Okay, um, but there are some easy cases, and in this case, the easy cases are you can recognize. So these are uh, kind of. So here you insist that the neighbors are even or odd. Uh, so this is like solving equations mod two. So these are linear equations mod two. Um, so the variables. OK, so I've got my commas wrong here. but anyway. um, So the variables uh, are either 0 or 1. And then the equations um, insist on whether you know, they say like an even number of these variables have to be true. Okay, so these are linear equations. These are matchings, which I've discussed. So the parity, how many, but the odd or even number of perfect matchings that we can do in polynomial time, um, that these people now gates, like the not 2, which is another category. Then there's a fourth class called vanishing sets, which are really sets of sets which, uh, which are really degenerate in that given any, compo any of these components in any arrangement, the answer is always 0. Okay. Um, but the, what the theorem says is that you know, if the set of components you give me is within one of these lines, then it's polynomial time computable. If it's not, like if it's a mixture of these lines or something outside these lines, then it's, it's MP hard. Okay, so this is a dichotomy. Every problem is, is categorized. Okay. Um, so a secondary question is whether the dichotomy is, is computable, which in this case is, is open. Um, so we're saying that every subset is either easy or hard, uh, whether as a consultant can tell you which is which, 
uh, is not totally resolved. Okay, so so I think one of the uh, achievements of of this uh, of of people working in counting theory are these very strong dichotomy theorems, which uh, uh, which for quite impressive cluster of problems really re resolve that. Um, you know, either these problems, are, either just are just one problem if the thing collapses, or at most two: the easy ones and the hard ones. The hard ones are all the same; the easy ones are all polynomial time. Okay, so that's some uh, notion of progress. Okay, so um, okay, so lastly, I've just got one slide for this. Um, so uh, so clearly, many people actually want to compute these quantities, and for many of them. Uh, you don't want to know the, the exact answer. Approximate answers are enough. And um, if you're satisfied with the approximate answers, there's some chance of getting them even when the exact answer you can't get. Um, so one issue with this field is that, um, although I, I emphasize that these various problems are very related to each other, you can map them to, another, to each other by, uh, for, for, for example, by these uh, projections, substitutions, uh, these approximations are lost. So this, so the class, so the counting problems when you approximate get much more confusing, much more difficult. Um, so you know, so one enormous focus now is to understand uh, um, the complexity of approximate, approximately counting all these kind of problems, which is much more complicated than I've made out. So just uh, okay. So there's some general notions that under some conditions. Um, Approximate counting is the same as some other things, and, the, and one of the other things is random generation. So randomly generating a solution is of the same difficulty as counting the approximate number, and that's often used. Um, so just a, an example of a, of a uh, triumph, so the result of Jerome Sinclair and Bigoda, that the permanent of matrices with positive entries uh, can be approximated in polynomial time. So the hardness is hard in the exact sense, but not if you um, uh, have 0, 1, for example. Um, but there are lots of open problems. So for example, so this is, ca this is counting matchings in bipartite graphs. If you want count to count matchings in uh, arbitrary graphs, looks similar. Uh, that's uh, totally open. So, um, so in approximate counting, the field is uh, the lot ha a lot has been done, but there are lots of open problems. Um, so, thank you. Yes. Well, uh, well, you you are counting something in the end, so so you do want an integer solution. <laughs>